with that, we'll move on uh, to the second talk of uh, our session 10 this morning, um, which is going to be by uh, Christina Silverhorn, uh, joining us from Paderborn University in Paderborn, um, talking about a uh, pretty, pretty big subject, um, nonlinear integrated quantum optics, uh, which I'm sure we're all looking forward to, certainly I am. All right, Christina, whenever you're ready. Okay. Can you see and hear me? Yep. Um, okay. Um, let me start also by thanking the organizer to giving me the opportunity to present my work at that workshop and actually to organize this workshop in these times, which I think is a great service to the whole community. It makes us feeling that we really can connect in the science community. So I wanted to be talking about quantum optics information science in multidimensional uh, <coughs> networks. Uh, let me start briefly to introduce my group. Um, because we actually have different subgroups and we do technology where we fabricate devices and I will tell you a little bit about that. Uh, then we bring them to the first optics labs and we try to fabricate our own devices and I think you will hear why we do that. And finally, we have the subgroup, what we call quantum networks, but this is really more applied to how can we transfer theoretical concepts um, to uh, real world applications and to see also fundamental research work. The group leaders are Christoph Eigner, Harald Hermann, and Engineer Brittning Brecht, who really also lead these subgroups. With that, let me come to the outline and basically to the different topics I want to talk about. And it's about multidimensional photonic systems. And I'm sure we have seen various ways how you can achieve multidimensional photonic systems. And maybe the most prominent is integrated optics. And I also will uh, show you a little bit what we are doing in the area of integrated optics, where you're, there are a lot of you are real experts on that. But then I also would like to talk about two different strategies, how you also can achieve multidimensional networks, which we tried to explore over the last years. The one of them is temporal modes of pulsed light, and I hope you will see why this is an interesting strategy. And the other one is time multiplexed quantum walks. So let me get started with integrated quantum optics. I would like to start right away that we are talking about nonlinear quantum integrated quantum optics. The uh, platform you're looking here is a Chi2 platform, uh, mostly on lithium niobate. And the reason why I want to do that is that, of course, we need minimized decoherence, low loss waveguides. I think we know that by now, integrated optics has the stability and the scalability always. But one thing which is tricky is, well, efficient photon pair generation, although I know that you can also use Chi free for that, uh, but maybe even more important is fast photonic routing so that you can have electro-optic control. And this is really where I think the challenge comes in and why it's worthwhile to explore a slightly different route. And this is what we're trying to pioneer and see how can we build circuits where all different elements and functionalities are on one chip. Now, I guess some of you have seen some of our work, but what we talk about is we have uh, photo pair generation, polarization control, single photon conversion, and phase shift all on one platform. Now, let me briefly introduce the technology we use for that. Um, mostly we're using titanium diffused waveguides where you have a titanium deposition, photolithography, and then you do by titanium diffusion, generate your waveguides. The advantage of these type of waveguides is that the TE and TM guiding, so you can use both polarizations, and this is a very established technique, and this is what is important. We have waveguides down to 0.03 dB per centimeter, which is a very important uh, property for quantum devices. The next step is then periodic polling, where you do again photolithography and then domain graph on a high voltage application. And again, what we did there is that we improved uh, the polling periods you can achieve. We are down to two micrometers and less. It's not the photolithographic limit we have there, but actually the polling process itself. Now, this is not all. Uh, when we have fabricated the waveguides, we do at the end first its dielectric coatings, uh, which we can also customize to our will, which is important for interfacing them, for example, to optical fibers to have low loss connections. And finally, this is what I show, we also bring them to a lab into pigtailing, where we can really achieve quite high pigtailing efficiencies already, but we're trying to improve on that too. Now, uh, I don't want to go into detail which kind of different device we have fabricated, but I want to show you uh, our most advanced device where you can see what can be done. 
So this is a recent work which was published in 2019, where we have a PDC section which is done with periodic pole uh, wave uh, guides. Then we have polarization control by actually um, change, uh, have polarization converters. Um, and we also have with a very clever design of using these polarization converters in uh, combination with birefringent fast optical delay. And finally here 50-50 beam splitter. What that is, is a monolithic integration of a parametric down conversion source and a two photon Hongo mantle interferometer with a variable time delay. And I think the important thing for this thing is that you can really electro optically control these things. Now, here you see on the left how this device looks. And this is our device with all the electrical contacts. Um, again, the device design and on the right, you see kind of what home dip efficiencies we can get. So the detection is off chip of everything else is on chip and we achieve uh, visibility of over 93% uh, and we also know why this could be improved. Um, the time delay which we have introduced in the system is 12 picoseconds. We could have them a little bit larger even. And I think this is a great opportunity where we really can also have that, for example, for quantum communication systems and synchronization events. Now, let me talk a little bit more about these fabrications and actually by the simulation of the fabrications. When we model these systems, we typically always assume that we have homogeneous system, we have nice waveguides, as you see the formers on the right. In fact, this is not what's happening. But of course, you have fabrication errors and you have inhomogeneous systems. And this is really crucial for these nonlinear devices. Why is that? Well, the fabrication limits of waveguides limits also how well we can do quantum optics experiments. And if you're interested, I would like to advertise the paper which we just published by Matteo Santea one example is it limits the maximum squeezing you can achieve in such waveguides in single pass. Or if you talk about high dimensional encoding, I don't tell you in detail, but this also, depending on how well your fabrication can be done, uh, you can have higher dimensional encoding for fabrication uh, spectrally entangled photon source. And I think this is what we just did, and it's quite interesting to look into that. Now, we did this for our systems, and this is depending on different lengths of the crystals. But then we looked, how is it with other systems? And it's interesting that we can come up with a generalized model where it's basically the phase mismatch which you have to calculate in a special normalized way. And you find that independent of which material you use for that chi from LNI, KTP, PCF fibers, you always see the same fidelity uh, rules, as the same fidelity behavior. So what that means, depending on a parameter which is here labeled by sigma and L, uh, you can say with which fidelity can you create some states and this in turn helps us to have design rules to know how well we have to control our fabrication. And this is just to show you how theory and experiments in this modeling is really important in combined things. With that, I would like to change gears and go to the second topic, which is temporal modes of pulsed light. Very briefly, temporal modes, I guess uh, several of you have heard about that. We used to talk about monochromatic modes if you're talking about spectral things. Um, however, they are not the whole truth because then if you have a monochromatic mode in frequency and time, it would be infinite time that can't be. So you have to find something like a mode creation operator, which is formed by Gaussian wave packet as shown as here. And then in the, the temporal domain, you also have nice confined wave packets. Now, if you already accept that you have to have an envelope function here, this Gaussian, you can define different envelope functions. And here we use the Hamid, fun Hamid uh, functions, which you know from local oscillator quantization. If you do that, you can define temporal modes, broadband modes, and mathematically, they act exactly as you used with monochromatic modes, they, they are orthogonal, and you can play with them to span a high-dimensional Hilbert space. And why is that used? Oh, well, one remark, of course, they overlap in time and frequency, and you have to do something clever to really harness them, and I will tell you later how to do that. Why is it interesting? Where did they come up with? Well, I think many people know those because they actually came up when people studied what's happening if you have a parametric down conversion source which you pump by pulsed a system. But what's happening is that you're generating is known signal idler photons, but you have a joint spectral amplitude. And if you analyze that, you do the Schmidt decomposition. And this is my graphical way of uh, really a very rough way to understand the Schmidt decomposition. The, other, the way to understand is that you're actually generating these different temporal modes, these strange modes which have these pulse shapes, where photon pairs always come in pairs in these new types of modes. And this is also where they really came up and why we're interested in that, because you also need them if you use any heralded source, you have to be able to control them. 
The way you typically control them is to do source engineering. So you, you look for systems where signal and idler wavelengths are decorrelated. You have only one Schmidt mode. So you have a Gaussian pump and because of specific dispersion properties, you only get signal and idler in also these uh, specific Gaussian uh, pulse shapes. However, you can do more, and this is what we are exploring. If you go to the specific dispersion properties and now you start shaping your pump, you actually can completely control the Hilbert space of these temporal modes. And that's quite nice because you have now a Hilbert space in these temporal mode bases, which is a high dimensional Hilbert space. You can do networking and everything on that, but you can directly transmit them via fiber because it's not different spatial modes, but it's these different temporal modes. This is what we had pioneering. But then comes the problem I just told you at the beginning, these temporal modes overlap in frequency and time. And here you see them here as the red input modes. So what you need is somehow an ad drop filter. So you need some knob, and this is for us a pulse, this is a, a, a pump pulse again, where you're able to select which temporal modes are you addressing. And we do that by a device which we um, pioneered, which was a quantum pulse gate. Let me briefly show what that is. It's a dispersion engineered some frequency generation with a transfer function you see experiment and theory on the right, where basically you have a flat transfer function. If you want to understand how this happens, it's a some frequency generation process with the gain single mode. In the same way that we engineer parametric down conversion sources now a lot to have a, only one spectral temporal uh, mode, we do the same from for some frequency generation and that does the trick to have this quantum pulse gate. Now, how do you use that? Well, and I think if you're interested in that, I just would like to highlight two papers, one which we did together with Mike Raymer, where we already, well, highlighted what we can do uh, and formulate a complete framework for information processing for that. And we also show you how you dispersion engineer these things. This is a, a review article in Optica, which just published. So this is a quantum pulse kit we have in Paderborn in our own labs. So you see we are using our own waveguides. This is a periodic pole lithium niobate waveguide, titanium diffused. Here you see some parameters. And here you also see why we are interested uh, in these uh, low polling periods, because you really need them to implement these more advanced devices. Now, uh, because I want to show you more, this is some of the latest results there. We combine um, uh, as engineer parametric down conversion source with our quantum pulse kit to analyze these temporal modes, to sort them, and then we do a tomography to really analyze these joint spectral intensity functions. Here you see on the right, first of all, joint spectral intensity, which is decorrelated, which has become very use, uh, common in these days. And with wet frequency, okay, then you don't have any correlations and you have your single mode in these temporal modes. If you introduce correlations, you expect that you have different modes, and this is also what you see here, that this is a different modes which are involved. And you can check them with the purity from the tomography and the G2 value, which you can also use to see how well the system works for the experts, coincide quite nicely. One thing I would like to point out um, is, well, if you just have a transpectal intensity function, you don't know everything, we introduced a chirp, and you see immediately, if you go to these temporal modes, that you get generate a, a lot of them too. So you have a high dimensional Hilbert space, you just don't see it in the spectral domain because it's in the temporal, uh, temporal domain. But anyhow, this for us means that we can control uh, these uh, modes, and this is really quite nice. And if you're interested, I would like to point you again to this PRL from 2018, we demonstrated more about that. Um, but these uh, quantum pulse case can do more, and this is the more recent work, which I would like briefly to mention here too. You can do quantum metrology with them. Oh, this should be a piece, sorry, it's for quantum pulse case. Uh, you probably have seen the work from Zhang et al, where they say, how can we estimate uh, the separation between two emitters, which are incoherent, they do that in the spatial domain. And as the separation comes too close, you expect that the Rayleigh limit kicks in and you can't separate them more. What we know if we have coherent detection, and this is basically what's uh, highlighted here, that the quantum pressure information tells you the gamma rho bound that this is not true, but you can still separate them. Well, the quantum pulse gate can do these tricks for time frequency domain. And this is uh, basically the problem formulated again. We have um, <coughs> two incoherent point sources. In our case, it's two incoherent temporal pulses or uh, spectral pulses. They have a separation, they have a center, and they have different heights. How can you estimate this? Well, for quantum pulse gate, we first showed that this is <coughs> now a separation 
uh, in the frequency domain, but you can also do it in the time domain. If you use the pulse gate to separate these out into the measurements, that you go below this Rayleigh limit and you have basically a complete nice separation, no matter how close they come. And our latest work shows you a complete multi-parameter estimation where you can estimate with uh, such projections on these temporal modes the distance as well as a, a centroid as well also as also these different amplitudes. And that's quite nice because I think that shows you this quantum pulse gate also opens new routes for quantum metrology applications. Now I assume I have something like five minutes left, is that correct? Yeah. So and this I would use to talk about our last topic, uh, time multiplex quantum walks, uh, which we use uh, also to get high dimensional systems. A very brief reminder, I guess you know what a time uh, quantum walk is. It's a coin and a step operation where you basically, depending on the coin, which in our case is polarization or hits the spin, uh, you decide for one walk, like in a golden pot, if you go left or right, you do your step and you repeat these things. And if you have a classical walk, you have this binomial distribution, while if you quantum walk, you get this broad distribution. Just a reminder, this distribution in the quantum domain that depends on the initial state as well as the coin operation. Now, we have been working on the topic for quite some time for trying, if we can see this, use this time multiplexing for quantum simulations. We do that not in space, but in time, but this, now it's not these temporal mods, but really time bins. And you can do that that double loop structure where this is a we introduce here um, a polarization dependent delay and we have a real coin operation with that half wave plate. Here on the right, you see um, really experimental data. Uh, this is actually quite old data from 2011, where you see that uh, the gray and the uh, uh, blue one is here in the experiment. And you see really nicely that you can get beautiful quantum box which have a, a really ideal homogeneity and a quite a good resource efficient in the sense that we had built that system once and this is over 28 steps. Now, what I want to show you here, what the latest progress there is that we finally implemented the quantum box with two photon states. So this is our quantum box system. This is the time multiplexing, but now we have included a new source and the source is a type two parametric down conversion source, a PPKTP crystal, uh, which is a single mode in spectrum spatially. So this is one temporal mode. And one thing which is the challenge here, that's a picosecond source. We need that because we have in our loops quite long fibers. But uh, if you go to picosecond, you have negligible dispersion such that you really then can uh, introduce these uh, two photon pulses into the system. And so the first experiment we looked is that we wanted to show what's happening if you synthesize different pulses. What do I mean by that? So we used our input states, then we use the networks to kind of implement different ways of photonic wave packets, where now we have different time bins, which are in coherence of the positions. And depending on the circuitry, which we have a complete dynamic control, we could either have time bin states where the single photons are delocalized always over two bins, but in the one case, they have a positive phase and the other ones we have introduced a negative phase. Why did we do that? Well, we wanted to test what kind of interference properties can two photons have in networks, in large complex networks. Now, depending, so this coherence, which we implemented here, allows you basically to synthesize the structure and actually allows you to understand complete interference behavior. Let me first look, if you look here, just the, the two different parts of the time bins come at that beam splitter. And if you just, Law, measure the pulses in a normal way, and we call it time result because you basically just look individual local and iterative position. You see that we get nice home dips independent of these phase. And this is clear because two single photons at these positions in ping on the beam splitter then, of course, give the home interference. interference. Now, if you don't understand this interference phenomena of the whole network, you could also say, well, this uh, photon, the blue and the red one, actually are single photons. Let's uh, uh, analyze them in a time bucket detection, which you would normally have in a home dip two, such that we take the two blue detectors together and the two red detectors together, and you don't distinguish. And then we ask for coincidences be uh, between them. And what you will see is the following. In the first case where there's basically no phase shift and these two photon pack wave packets are the same, we get back this nice home dip. So we have a global quantum interference. 
While if we have introduced a phase shift of pi, you get a completely different behavior. These two pulses, and they maybe remind you to different Hamid modes, have actually, if you integrate over them, if you do it the time packet in, no overlap. And in fact, we see that the quantum interference completely diminishes. Why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because this is a way how we can understand quantum interference in large networks. You look, what is the photonic wave packets? What is the coherence properties? And then you can see that you can control kind of in this networks which interferences occur. You can do that not only with one pin, but with all different pins. And here you see three pins. So you can go here to high dimension with these different pins. And you see that this can also be, well, a nice way of understanding networks in a bit better way and controlling quantum interference in these networks. But I think my time is more or less over. I would like to summarize. I showed you different ways how we look to multidimensional systems. I showed you the integrated optics part we have where we look at nonlinear integrated optics introduce the temporal modes of pulse flight, and last but not least, I also introduced you the time multiplex quantum modes. At the very end, I would like to thank you for your attention, but I also would like to point out that this is not my work on my own, but there's a big group, it's a great group who is really looking and working with that. So thank you very much for the contribution of all of them, and of course, also to the funding agencies. All right, thank you very much, Christina. That was fantastic. I think, um, Nobody, uh, nobody should be in doubt that <laughs> Paderborn, you are the masters of time and frequency. <laughs> um, so uh, we have uh, we have a good we have a good lot of questions. So we'll see um, how many we can get through. Um, there are, uh, are a couple of questions about um, kind of uh, te technology, uh, process technology, uh, things like this. So um, I'm going to combine a couple of them. Uh, so Jake Bulmer asks, what are the challenges of increasing the scale and complexity of your lithium niobate devices? And I'm going to just add on a question from Fabian Kaufman. Um, Fabian asks, uh, do you see any disadvantage of lithium niobate on insulator compared to your platform? I think these are connected. Okay. So the scaling, of course, this is what we have already said. It, these are rather large devices and you have to see how to overcome that lithium niobate on insulate. It's of course one way. And I think this, what we do is preparing work for really also doing an LNI. I should, should say that we're also pioneering that. But for that reason, I included in my talk these fabrication error tolerance things, because this is, I think, really what we need. If you ask what is the scaling, you have to ask what are the quality of the states you can generate. And this is actually a non-trivial um, question, because they have to be the same. And I think this is why we started that work. And I would like really have a look at this uh, paper. There you see quite nicely what kind, how well you have to control your things in LNOI, this will be one real challenge. All right, do you have plans to move towards the lithium niobate on insulator? We're already working on that. We have okay. not published work, but we are already doing things. We'll, watch, steps. <laughs> we'll watch the archive. Um, Francesco Graffiti asks, uh, what is the expected heralded purity in the lithium niobate devices? Are you already trying to integrate to independent sources on one chip and interfere them? Um, this is also interesting. Um, unfortunately, for direct LNOI, we also have a paper on that from uh, Evan Meyer Scott from last year, mm -hmm. where you can show that you can't produce them in a direct way. There's one way out, which is counter propagating. This is another paper on Optics Express. You should look at that. But in this way, if you directly use in co-propagation, it's impossible to have uh, really states which have um, decorrelated spectra. One way out might be uh, the second step, these temporal modes of pulse flight. We kind of operate on those, but you can't directly use them in LNI. Uh, mm -hmm. The alternative is use KTP and then hybrid sources. All right. So perhaps uh, in the next little while, we'll start seeing uh, source multiplexing coming out of your group uh, once this problem gets cracked? Well, we do things like that already in the time domain. I uh, haven't, pop well, I think it's in the archive. Um, okay. But um, with on-chip, it's really a challenge. I should, I said challenge, I think, for all platforms, to be honest. Absolutely. Um, all right, we have uh, a few more questions. So how are we doing for time? All right, I'm gonna ask one more question and then uh, I hope that the conversation can continue on the Slack. Um, so I hope that you can get that sorted out uh, as well, Christina. Um, so uh, Zi Jin Huang asks, uh, for implementing the quantum pulse gate for separation estimation, do you need 
to time overlap the pulse and the signal, i.e. precise knowledge of the centroid of the two pulses? We ha you have to prepare them that, yes, we did that. Uh, you can do that with spatial light modulators. So in these, yes, you, you must be able to program these different time uh, distances. Look in the paper, we have done it there. You can do that with spatial light modulators. All right. Um, well, thank you very much again for an Thanks excellent very time, much. Uh, Professor Silverman.